we're running a little bit late, so uh, let's get going quite quickly because we have to be finished here by about six o'clock. Uh, we don't want to keep you all day. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for coming um, and give you perhaps a very quick introduction to the cluster program and the AA Fab cluster and what we've been up to for the last couple of years. Um, just to put in context the, the speakers we have uh, gathered together today to have a discussion about design to fabrication. Um, the cluster program was initially set up uh, about four years ago now, three or four years ago, um, by the director's office as a kind of platform or means um, to facilitate alternative sorts of uh, academic experimentation and learning that sort of ran alongside but was separate to the, the formal programs in the school. So basically, it was to set up a, an environment where um, different agendas, <laughs> events, um, and research um, interests could be pursued without the sort of requirements or constraints of complying with um, undergraduate or postgraduate uh, examinations or requirement or degree requirements. Um, and I think the intention was also to to, to use these um, research programs to connect the school in a vertical way across um, disciplines and uh, across years as well, from undergraduate to postgraduate. The FAB cluster um, was initiated two years ago, and I think our interest was really to, to pursue um, and facilitate um, new research projects into the emerging application of digital design um, tools and um, fabrication technologies. I think we were very keen to try and set up a resource that would allow students and staff um, and any interested parties outside the school to collaborate, to go beyond the kind of um, superficial seductiveness of a lot of the digital computation um, we were seeing coming out of the design studios. And the question was, how do we push this a little bit further that can perhaps um, make the programs working within the school a little bit more rigorous or provide certain opportunities for them to, to explore the actual implications in terms of what are the potentials of design and computation and how can they be implemented uh, in a material way and how do we work within those constraints that sort of carry that innovation um, forward through to built work. I think in behind that was the interest um, also of how these tools, how these techniques are actually changing the nature of practice or how they have the potential to change the nature of practice. Um, it's one thing to experiment um, spatially and formally, but I think perhaps the more significant and long-lasting impacts of these design tools and technologies is really how they can begin to reconfigure um, our profession and our discipline. And in order to do that, we really needed to um, to take a step back, if you like, and rather than have a, a strong curatorial agenda, was to set up um, a facility where we acted more like an agency to allow others to conduct the research. Um, and it was really giving, them, giving staff and students within the school an opportunity to pursue their design research um, in a much more, I guess, constrained and real way um, out in the world. And that involved setting up partnerships with sponsors um, and manufacturers and the first year we ran a competition um, which was open to staff and students and it, it offered significant sort of financial and manufacturing expertise and resources to allow them to take a project through to prototype it um, and actually test it in a number of uh, built material configurations and ultimately aiming at a kind of final prototype. Um, and this is just a, a, a shot of the exhibition, which uh, I guess is the culmination of this cycle of the program, which is currently on down in, um, in Shoreditch in East London. So it's open till tomorrow. Uh, so please, I'd encourage everybody to attend. Um, this is the work of two of the projects we finally selected, and I'm not going to go into them. They're here today to present it to you. But the point really was to take it from a, an early stage um, and allow them to develop and test um, their ideas. Um, in, through multiple different kind of media and forms and both internally within the school using school facilities uh, but outside expertise and also um, in the case of 
two of the final pieces in the show um, to collaborate with uh, external manufacturers to realize um, a significant prototype. In addition to that, at the same time, it was very apparent to us that this, this, these questions we're kind of interested in are not are in no way unique or in, no, or in no way is the AA unique in pursuing them. Um, and it, it's part of a much wider, I guess, discourse going on internationally. Um, and also, I think there's a kind of implication underlying that the use of these tools is that in, it, in addition to being able to, to facilitating us or allowing us to manufacture and design and fabricate things in a very different way, it's also instigating new sorts of collaborations that, that are literally international in nature and really don't, uh, I think, really defy the kind of traditional or older logics of design and manufacture, which was, it was very specifically geographically located. <laughs> Um, and this diagram here on the bottom is, is from one of the exhibitors in the show which really charts the evolution from design to production of one of the pieces in the show which was a, a glass cladding system and how it goes from in terms of knowledge gets transferred across um, continents and also material as stuff gets tested and built as a mock-up in one place and shipped to another and then examined and tested in another etc etc. So we really wanted to I, I guess acknowledge that uh, and in a similar way that the diagram up in the top is actual uh, from another um, contributor to the show Andrew Cudless and it's really a, it, it's a, di a diagram of the control system for, for one of the pieces they designed for the show but at any point along one of these nodes it's so I insanely complex is a potential for an outside collaborator or a manufacturer or a specific, specific piece of expert knowledge to feed into it. Um, so I think we wanted to put the work of the program into this much wider context. And the second year's awards uh, were really designed to address that. Um, they, it was an international call looking for work that was already built internationally by um, both academics and young pr practitioners um, that was interested in the same questions and really pursuing another kind of architectural innovation um, through material uh, experimentation. Um, and I think, as I said at the beginning, underlying all of that is this real questioning about what, what is the future of a discipline looking like? How are these tools enabling new kinds of collaboration, um, new kinds of output? And these are just some of the diagrams from exhibitors in the show and we asked them to produce a kind of map of what they thought their design process uh, looked like for the project they had submitted because I think Many of us have this um, sort of idea about the design profession and where the architect sits, and it tends to be a very hierarchical tree. And I think the issue that these tools and technologies raise is actually that's very rarely the way uh, the profession operates. So I, I think we're interested in what does this collaboration, what does this process look like, and what kind of forms can it take? Um, so that's perhaps a question we can raise today. Um, the running order, uh, we're a bit late, um, but basically we have mixed things up a little bit um, and grouped it into two panels. I think um, there's an awful lot of overlap between them. Um, so I think the more informal we keep it and just see where the conversation goes, but um, there's three 2009 award ease in the first group and, and one from 2008 and the same with the second group. Uh, if we have time, if we manage to, to make up a bit of time, we can have a bit of a discussion halfway through. Um, but otherwise, we'll see how we get on. We may leave it to the end, given that we're already 45 minutes late. So without um, taking up any more of your time, I'd like to introduce Andrew Rana and Joe Maple Link from um, Houston. Full screen. Yeah. OK. 
Okay. Thank you, Alan. Um, I'm glad we left these slides in. These these were uh, really meant for our previous talk, but I think it's uh, maybe relevant to your introduction. Um, our um, our practice, Metalab, is closely aligned with our with our. Uh, pedagogical interests. Uh, in fact, Andrew and I met uh, about five years ago teaching digital fabrication at the University of Houston. Um, metal Lab is a fairly old practice for me. It began as an architectural metal fabricating shop uh, about 12 years ago uh, that was engaged with digital fabrication for very pragmatic reasons. Uh, it saved us a lot of time and, uh, and effort on, on our projects. Um, Andrew and I realized that um, that uh, we could reimagine this practice through uh, through the lens of digital fabrication, um, and and much more effectively utilize uh, these uh, technologies that exist all around us in Houston. So this is the traditional model, and the problem here uh, lies in this thin, uh, light gray line. Uh, the problem with that line is that the information that uh, ultimately leads to the execution and installation of, of, a, of, of a project and its uh, constituent components is, uh, is, is really clouded uh, and separated from, uh, from the design intent through the, through the process of subcontracting, shop drawings, interpreting of shop drawings, and ultimately executing and placing those, uh, those often critical moments in a project. Um, so we've, we've sought to close that loop by becoming uh, what we call ourselves uh, subcontract suppliers. Uh, and that's a thorny issue uh, at times uh, for insurance reasons and, and, uh, and uh, you know, it, it, uh, it is somewhat at odds with the typical project delivery method. Uh, but it's something that we've been able to uh, kind of write into our contracts as architects and, and also kind of control the back end of a project as uh, as uh, uh, experts in digital fabrication, uh, suppliers of these of these critical uh, building components, um, and at at times, uh, you know, uh, it, it works for us to also take on the role of construction manager. Uh, what we should have here in this diagram actually is the contractor should still remain present because that's work that we don't really aspire to do and it's very uh, it's very difficult work and that that foil still needs to be there between you know between the uh, between us as designers and the execution of a project for for a number of reasons but construction management is a is a profession that is uh, cropped up I guess over the last 10 years as as a kind of intermediary between you know architect owner you know and and, and our struggles uh, and and the owner right so the construction manager comes in steps in and, and kind of smooths things over. Uh, we think that the technology that we use and the processes that we employ uh, perhaps uniquely enable us to act as construction managers and have this kind of overarching um, uh, uh, control is maybe the wrong word, but a, a kind of overarching uh, uh, understanding of, of project delivery, uh, especially when these, uh, uh, you know, when these tools and processes are uh, in, in play. Um, and this is, this is something that we refer to as our uh, fluid campus, and, uh, and uh, in our practice, it's, our, it's a map of our collaborators. I, th I think, uh, you know, some, some line work might be in order here, kind of describing the frequency of use and the, you know, the, maybe the dollar values that are flowing in between these, uh, um, in between these entities. But, you know, Houston is, is a unique place in that, um, you know, it's a post-industrial city. Nothing there is uh, more than about 100 years old, and that's fairly rare. Uh, it has no history. It's a sprawling megacity, uh, and it's full of this uh, kind of uh, industrial middle ground. Uh, it, is, it has the largest manufacturing capacity in North America, but you don't know it because there's no GM on the side of the buildings. Uh, the industry is atomized in, in, uh, in these small businesses around Houston, and that uh, this is the context uh, in which we work, and and it's a very it's very effective for us. There's a uh, certainly flow of information both directions, and that uh, very much informs uh, informs our work, um, and uh, uh, and it enables us to to do this uh, to do what we do. Um, we in our practice we certainly use you know all of these uh, all of these industries in our uh, in our teaching. We also advocate to use these industries for our students. It's not as important for us necessarily to have 
all of the equipment under one roof as it is for our students to understand how to engage, uh, how to engage industry. It's a different language uh, <coughs> that we speak. Uh, from theirs, uh, they tend to specialize. Uh, now, th and that specialization is something very, very important again to our work. Uh, you know, there, there's a kind of knowledge that comes from their hands, and the way they express it is, uh, you know, is interesting, funny, engaging, um, but ultimately very important. One thing, one thing that we've learned, uh, uh, both in teaching and in practice, as we scale our work up, the um, the complexity of the uh, equipment tends to uh, tends to lose its effectiveness, meaning five axis equipment, even three axis equipment begins as as we scale up to have less and less uh, effectiveness both both uh, in terms of material cost and uh, and uh, and general efficacy uh, time and processing and so on so uh, but we don't want that to become uh, an impediment to the work so we're going to show uh, Three projects quickly here, uh, ending in the in the last project, which uh, which was selected here, and Andrew will talk a little bit more about the process. Uh, but but the common thread to these three projects is uh, simple material removal, uh, perforation, you could say, that that allows us to uh, form a material or uh, form and then aggregate a material into a more complex uh, uh, composition. Uh, and and uh, there's there's three kind of end results, right? One is uh, compound curvature, top, uh, topological surface, uh, a an object of single curvature, and then finally an aggregation of uh, faceted uh, components, which uh, we'll talk more in more detail about. Um, this is uh, this is a project we presented a couple of years ago at Acadia, and and is. Uh, as we speak, I believe it's being cut full scale. This is a quarter scale model of, um, of a, um, uh, I guess, a contemporary reinterpretation of a 1963 uh, commission uh, that was designed by Frederick Kiesler. Uh, Frederick Kiesler did a, did a project for uh, a utopian town called uh, New Harmony, Indiana, and this was the Grotto for Meditation. We, uh, we studied this project with our visiting critic, Ben Nicholson, and uh, and uh, we attempted through the course, it's a very long story, but through the course of the, uh, of the studio, we realized that there were several parallels between uh, Kiesler's work in New Harmony and the condition that we had in Houston uh, next to the College of Architecture building. Uh, so as it turns out, we, end up, uh, we ended up finding a, p a parcel of land in a quadrangle at, uh, at the University of Houston to place this project uh, in its new context. Uh, so we, we spent the semester imagining what would, uh, what would Kiesler do uh, given the technological uh, capabilities and processes that we have today. Uh, this is our site on the campus. Uh, they, uh, it, it includes a pond, as did Kiesler's original uh, proposal, included water f uh, a water uh, feature uh, and, and this kind of burned earthwork. Um, we, uh, we extract, we do have a, we do have a, a capable uh, shop facility at, at U of H and uh, you know we certainly use that to prototype at small scale and, and to begin to understand uh, these processes. This is one of our students assembling uh, laser cut uh, plywood. Uh, this was a this was a Voronoi uh, volume script that we kind of misused and applied to a, a, in fact a very thin volume or shell. Uh, Kiesler's original uh, design was was in fact uh, a, a shell form, a very literal uh, and symbolic shell form. We, in the manner of Darcy Thompson, we kind of picked another shell, uh, you know, a long, a long uh, kind of elongated spiral uh, nautilus, and, and, uh, and we took that form and, and, and uh, essentially acknowledged, acknowledged gravity by dropping this point grid this, uh, with, a, with a central axis onto this form, uh, thereby creating this Voronoi pattern, essentially, that draped over the form as it draped. Uh, it, it transitioned from a kind of uh, waffle structure at the top that acted as a beam to a more elongated cells on the sides that uh, essentially acted more like columns and it was a structural intuition that this would be, uh, you know, in fact an effective and minimal structure. Um, each of the components, I think the next slide shows, yeah, each of the components are well, they're broken into two categories, uh, uh, ribs and connectors. The ribs are the kind of question mark shaped pieces that zigzag with alternating convex and concave bends from the tail of the, of the shell form 
around to the uh, to the underside where it curls under itself. Uh, Kiesler was very uh, very intrigued with this idea of continuous tension, where uh, trabeation kind of disappears, right, and nothing is a either a beam or a column. So the the idea was that each of these each of these elements through the moment connection that we uh, that we uh, uh, used at each at each uh, at each node would become a kind of hybrid beam column uh, and, and uh, would never, in fact, have this uh, columnar relationship to ground or, or to one another. Uh, so the, um, the connectors have, uh, are Z-shaped. They have a convex and a concave bend. All the information is etched onto each, each piece. So, so this is uh, you know, a kind of simple bending operation. Uh, we, we laser cut little jigs to, uh, you know, for each bend that were everything alphanumerically coded, and of course it fit together. Um, and, you know, this upper right slide is very important to us. This is the way we work. Uh, this is, we, we encourage our students to have this kind of quick exchange between the head and the hand, right, between thinking and making. Uh, you, you know, that we, we don't try to confuse the two. Uh, each has their own place. In fact, the fabricators that we work with, they don't think, overthink things. They just kind of get right to the point and, and do what they do. And, we, and that's very important. Uh, it's important for us, too. Um, but, uh, you know, this is, this is where that kind of uh, back and forth happens very rapidly in the shop. Uh, in fact, we had one person who was really doing most of the thinking there. Um, somebody just laid their gloves by it to look like work. Um, but they're, you know, they're driving and telling, you know, a crew of uh, four or five students where to put the pieces and which way to bend the bends. And uh, this, this piece is about, it's about 800 unique pieces that went together in a day uh, with, with four people who had never welded. So, uh, you know, this, this is the power of digital fabrication to uh, greatly, uh, it always surprises, it surprises us how, um, how much it contracts the, the build and installation time when, when, the, when, the, uh, you know, when, the, uh, when that time is put in up front digitally. So this is the interior. This is a quarter scale model. This is made of uh, 16 gauge stainless steel, about a sixteenth of an inch thick. Uh, so it's a quarter scale in thickness as well. It weighs about, 60 pounds and is uh, ex extremely strong and, li and lightweight. Uh, we are now cutting, uh, as I said, we're cutting the full-scale components uh, this week, I believe. The upper sections, the kind of small sections, are will be an eighth-inch uh, stainless steel, and they are probably four inches in height. And as the as as the uh, shape curves around, we we increase to quarter inch and and finally three-eighths inch uh, steel plate. Um, all of which is weakened by this little perforation that allows us to bend it. Um, the, um, this is another, uh, this is a project of our practice, actually a photo booth, uh, which I'll move through quickly. This is a single curvature uh, exercise. Um, we, we were uh, contracted by a photography studio to uh, uh, design and fabricate a prototype, which they uh, intend to take into mass production. Uh, and, and uh, kind of sales and rental. Um, so uh, we developed this perforation pattern that would allow us to not just uh, crease, uh, crease the plate, but to, to bend it and create this kind of uh, Macintosh aesthetic hominid shape in a room. We decided that the uh, curtain could go away, that social space is no longer self-conscious. And uh, so the uh, photo booth is in fact just an object in the room. But uh, uh, we uh, we wrote a script to play a uh, grasshopper script to play with this uh, perforation pattern. Um, we know intuitively what it takes to bend steel. This this piece is made of uh, 11 gauge carbon steel, which was then powder coated. So we, you know we have a certain rule, an intuitive rule about how much you know the aggregate bridges need to add up to right along these lengths, uh, which is really just kind of a memory, muscle memory. How much how much steel can you bend? You know. Uh, and so the, the uh, aggregate bridge length here is, you know, maybe two to three inches. So we could, uh, we could play with this script. And we, we built this a couple of times uh, in, in cardboard. Oops, let me go back here. Um, and then we uh, uh, had the pieces cut from one fabricator, sent it to another of our fabricators who have a lot of patience with uh, kind of hand assembling and finishing and so on. Uh, this is the finished piece right after powder coating and before the equipment was installed. Uh, so we... we uh, left space for a flash camera, and then the lower rectangle is the touchscreen interface, and the, uh, has a built-in dolly and so on. So th there were a lot of, uh, kind of parameters uh, that kind of had to pack inside this, uh, in inside this thing. 
our clients were great. They wrote the software and, uh, for the touch screen. Uh, and then, and then, last project here. I'll let Andrew uh, uh, drive now. But this is this is a very uh, kind of flat pack uh, method of aggregating these components with uh, with a perforation strategy that that is very narrow and allowed us to fold and assemble the units and then varies across the surfaces of the units. So with that, uh, I'll turn it over. Uh, <clears throat> so that we uh, we balance our practice with uh, teaching at the University of Houston been there about five years uh, and we worked with Scott Marble uh, as a visiting critic uh, from he teaches at Columbia uh, where I went to grad school about 10 years ago and uh, I didn't study with him but it's been very interesting to kind of look at his work evolve the past few years and then bring him in to to uh, to, to advise us uh, we were commissioned to kind of redesign a 3,000 square foot space in, in that was opening up in the in our architecture building into a student services center and Due to you know budgetary and, and kind of political constraints, we became more and more interested in kind of leaving the ground and, and floating above it with a ceiling cloud uh, within an exhibition space of three, three, about uh, 800 square feet. Uh, and so we to work with a, a large group of students and and to maintain sort of uh, 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 some direction within it, you have to kind of work uh, strategically through different methods and then also kind of uh, maintaining a connection to uh, the, the the performative criteria that that you would want to kind of bring into something like this. So, uh, the, the, this gradients represent the 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 degree to which uh, certain certain themes were important earlier on and maybe dissipated in the middle and then reemerged towards the the end of the project. But the the uh, the precedents you know that that are very well known here, of course, when you begin to sort of think about. Uh, how to work in a contemporary mode relative to history, of course, is looking at the Baroque and uh, Bernini's, you know, uh, dramatic spaces, and then more contemporary uh, examples of aggregate structures, Tara Donovan and the kind of cloud uh, scapes she makes, but also the 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 ubiquity of the of the the ceiling grid in kind of the modern corporate uh, workspace, uh, made famous now with the set of of uh, Mad Men and the. the uh, that that system, right? That, that one has to deal with. We knew that was going to have to come into the space in some way, and with, it, with that that trade was going to be inserted into the project. So to work uh, effectively, we thought about a way to kind of connect to that. Uh, kind of looking at other works that, that were influencing us was uh, uh, Anish Kapoor's Islamic Mirror, where whereby a, a system of aggregate is then uh, it, it one resolution further away is is then kind of met, uh, reflects the space and becomes a, a, a sort of measurement of, of the light within it. We, uh, we, we kind of perform the same uh, operations on, on built models. We're able to kind of look at the light in the acoustics and, and begin to kind of measure those in, in real time. Uh, we did use Ecotect uh, early on to kind of the, the, the series of, of, of shots at the top where we were uh, you know, looking at all the iter iterations of a, of a kind of corrugated pattern and what that might mean. And then uh, with our design, we kind of ran more specific uh, 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 analysis on it. But we found uh, the information was just uh, overwhelming within the time we had to kind of integrate it. So we took a more intuitive approach to lighting and acoustics whereby low frequency would be dissipated by a, cor a corrugation in the panels and higher frequencies would be sort of uh, allowed to pass through the sieve through the through the, the micro perforations. Uh, again, it, looking at Anish Kapoor and that kind of the, the when you zoom into the system, right, you begin to see uh, the lighting effect having a, a different role on the on the units. Uh, we were also interested in the arabesque as a as a as a point of departure, whereby uh, kind of two uh, rectangular arrays and, and circular arrays. Uh, how those two kind of systems work within each other, uh, and then our RCP sort of reflects that 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 role of uh, kind of the, the 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 radial and the and the 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 recti rectilinear uh, arrays working together. Uh, this model was was a uh, uh, it was a one inch equals a foot uh, uh, American scale, which made a very large model where we could kind of really begin to kind of stage the the the, the light within it and measure that. Uh, the power of the parametric software, I think, was most effective in really taking on the, 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 the idea of a gradient into a much more visceral uh, approach to controlling the, 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 uh, the geometry of the, of the panels relative to the, the density of the, of the perforations. 
and we built 20% uh, uh, 20, 20 of the actual ceiling at full scale through, through uh, with a, we outsourced that final part with a, a fabricator in Houston who, who laser cut this out of very thin sheet metal. Uh, synonymous with the, the, par the parametric modeling, there was a very uh, conscious decision about what the, what the units could be, what size they could be relative to sheet sizes they're cut out of, and then how quickly it could be put together. And so our final assembly w went together in one afternoon. And another shot down the, the side. And then designing assemblies was a very uh, uh, important part of uh, Scott's agenda to bring into this, how to kind of begin to, to think uh, aggregately relative to the assembly processes. And so at the top you see uh, a, a standard ceiling grid, uh, T, T sections being modified uh, with a hanger system and then gussets and, 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 and rivets to begin to, uh, to assemble the panels into the, the final assembly. And this is that, that section we built at full scale within the entire array. Uh, we built a frame to, to suspend it. We have a large atrium at our architecture school where we could, we could, we could display it. And this is lifted a little higher to begin to see the light uh, passing through it. That's it. Thank you. About one project. Uh, it's called uh, the Morning Line, and it's a project that uh, we've been working on with an artist, um, Matthew Ritchie. He invited us uh, to do this collaboration um, some time ago say about two and a half years ago. And uh, just by way of introduction, um, sorry, this is not the project. Uh, my name is Benjamin Aranda. I'm coming from a firm in New York called Aranda Lash. And uh, about, I'd say, two and a half years ago, we were, uh, we were invited with uh, uh, by Matthew Ritchie, who's an, uh, an artist painter in New York City, to uh, to collaborate on, on on an idea he had to uh, to bring a drawing into space. Uh, he's an artist that um, that works uh, works with painting, but kind of expands painting beyond uh, beyond the walls. So uh, this is a collaboration, uh, this sort of topic of discussion uh, with an artist. Uh, engineer uh, uh, Daniel Bozia from Arup, and um, and also uh, a commissioning organization, an arts organization uh, called TBA 21, who uh, who were the uh, driving force behind this project. So Matthews, um, you know, how do you how do you work with an artist? I mean, you, uh, the artist has uh, their projects that they have carried throughout their 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 oeuvre. And Matthew's project has always been to, uh, to paint, uh, to, but to uh, paint the story of the universe. And it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's an incredibly, uh, obviously, ambitious uh, uh, project. But, um, but he has this idea that, uh, that information can be stored um, in a drawing. And, uh, and he, when we first started talking about the project, he talked about drawings as bits of information. And working with an idea on uh, on uh, on a particular uh, new theory of uh, about the the Big Bang, um, which is called the cyclical theory or the cyclical Big Bangs, uh, he wanted us t to uh, to develop an idea where um, every bit of space can be imagined to either grow or collapse. Uh, an infinite number of spaces. So, so the challenge initially was to develop kind of one little bit of information that could scale. Um, but scale in two senses, both geometrically, um, so literally the, the units that we would work with would kind of scale up the, the hand of the artist in a way but also uh, through expression. Uh, so there's kind of two narratives. There's like the, there's the structure and the geometry, but there's also the expression of that structure and geometry. And how the, how the expression kind of changes uh, through the system 
uh, is really uh, based on a set of rules that are given over to, to the artist. And the artist then decides, Matthew then decides, what kind of a picture he wants to paint in space. So this, the first instantiation of the project, uh, these images that we're seeing, was done for the uh, Venice Biennale last year. And you can see in this image, um, the four, well, in, in this view, actually three different scales of the, uh, of, of, the, of, of the bit that we call it. Kind of very small, like the size of a, a melon, uh, the size of a basketball, and then uh, the larger scale. Um, now, it's, it's based on a fractal, um, uh, a, a truncated triangle, uh, which, um, which is self-scalar and, can, uh, and cre can create networks. Um, so it's a very, um, it's a very simple, uh, highly modular way of, uh, of building uh, ag aggregations. Uh, and uh, working, uh, applying a certain like structural logic onto these uh, onto these units, you're able to ensure stability um, uh, and connectivity, so that um, so that every line connects into every other line at every scale. And when the geometry is extracted, uh, what you get is um, uh, is a picture in space where all the lines uh, not only carry the, the load of the piece or perform structurally, but they also express the, uh, the narrative of the piece across it. The second um, instantiation of, of the morning line was in Seville uh, for the Biennale last year, uh, right on the tail end of the Venice Biennale. Um, and we were able to uh, basically scale it up one generation. So, you know, the different sizes of the bits are different generations, let's say. And this is uh, what it looks like scaled up once. So it begins to confront at this scale some of the, uh, some of the issues that are germane to, to architecture. Um, so I'm just showing some final images first, and then I'm just going to run through how it was fabricated to wrap it up. So you have uh, here, let's say, uh, first generation. It's a very large drawing, kind of a piece of a big uh, truncated tetrahedra. The second generations are the uh, structural elements that form these um, uh, kind of structural uh, arches or sort of tripods that frame the space and set up, set up the program. And then you have the third and fourth generation, which uh, which deal with um, um, uh, program, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. If you could let me know when I have like five minutes left, that would be great, just because I know that we're tight for time. So this is, um, uh, this is a plan of, of the structure, and it tells, you know, it tells, uh, tells a story uh, moving through it that um, that is particular to, our, um, to Matthew's uh, work. Uh, the drawings change and they, they, they move from a certain character from one end, a kind of crystalline character, to a more chaotic character on the other end. And there's a kind of narrative that's mapped onto this uh, that is part of his, um, part of his work. Um, beneath that, uh, or embedded into that, is um, uh, is a sound and audiovisual system that uh, that basically creates uh, rooms, kind of sound rooms. So each of these cones is a speaker that's embedded in in the third generation units. So certain sizes of those bits hold speakers, uh, little speakers and big speakers, um, and they basically construct uh, these sound rooms. And sound can um, uh, sound can be manipulated to travel kind of in the space, in and around the space. So as a collaborative device, the morning line is then opened up to, to musicians and composers to come in and use it as, as an instrument. So it was, um, it's really interesting to us, this kind of toggle between the kind of expression and then the more performative geometry uh, as a way where 
all of these collaborations uh, uh, become manifest. I'm not going to run through some of the movies, but you can see some of the musicians actually playing the piece. Um, um, but I'm going to just show you this. I'm um, just going to kind of run through all these. So uh, this is the, um, uh, the fourth generation unit. So you can see uh, how it's cut. The third generation uh, is welded into its, um, in a jig. Uh, and the second generation, which these are the more structural ones, had to be shipped uh, flat packed and then, um, and then constructed as these kind of autonomous units uh, on site. Uh, so there's a kind of, uh, you know, you really get rewarded, I think, by, um, by mining the, the possibilities of modularity. Um, but it's not a kind of fixed modularity. I think your computer just uh, went out. Pick it up from here. All right. So, um, uh, so I was saying that uh, you know you're kind of rewarded by modularity, but it's not a fixed modularity. And the um, uh, the drawings are used in the piece not only to um, let's say kind of express uh, or provide an expression um, that the artist uh, wanted to use, but the drawings are also used as a as a kind of instruction to to piece. The, uh, the, the structure together on site. So these large structural um, uh, tetras are, are literally, um, <laughs> I love Max, uh, are literally pie pieced together using the drawings so that the drawings actually have to, uh, have to match. And, then, uh, and that's how the builders know how, how, whether it's assembling correctly and whether it grows in the right direction. So, um, so the expression of the geometry, you know, not only, um, uh, not only uh, provides a, uh, the, the picture in space, but it also provides the instructions to, uh, to make the space. Um, and, you know, what you're looking at right now are some awesome images of the pieces coming together. Um, if you guys have any, you know, uh, we're really good at fabricating stuff, but we really... Uh, we still have a way to go with presenting work. Uh, so the, uh, like I was saying, the drawings serve as not only the kind of expression, but the, the, uh, the, the instructions to actually put the piece together. So, um, you know, we've, all, we've been interested in this, in this way of building with, uh, with, with independent components and aggregated units uh, for some time, and this was, our, uh, this was our opportunity to really try it out at, a, at an architectural scale. Um, so every piece uh, is, is coded with... Uh, with its neighboring information, constructs the, uh, the structural arches, and then allows for, um, uh, 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 allows to build a framework onto which these smaller units uh, build off of, uh, and the larger ones even uh, uh, um, uh, fit into. Um, I should say we, uh, we, we used, uh, the, the fabricators on this job are from York uh, Sheet Fabs, and um, uh, they were re remarkable. Uh, the tolerances in this piece were uh, were down to the, the millimeter. Um, so the um, uh, I mean I think that there's a there was a lesson here for us. Um, you know, one is that uh, you can get a lot of uh, kind of variation and uh, an expression uh, through uh, through a, a real strict uh, implementation of modularity. Uh, we we didn't we intentionally didn't. Uh, change the module across the piece, but rather stuck with uh, an incredibly rigid uh, framework. Um, 
because we were interested in kind of how the sort of, you know, the aggregate assembly um, uh, is perceived. And the last thing I'll say is that one of the, one of the intentions uh, here uh, was to produce a kind of third drawing, if you will. Like, um, we had the drawings that were mapped onto the geometry, and we had, um, and we knew how they would work in space. Um, but when you walk around the piece, um, because we used this black aggregate uh, coating on the aluminum plates, so it's all aluminum, covered with this kind of epoxy black aggregate, um, what happens is the, the, the piece kind of generates like an infinite number of drawings as you, as you move around it. And that in itself is kind of, uh, is, has a certain, you know, uh, un uncontrollable nature, which, uh, which uh, really served, uh, served the piece, I think, well. And also uh, combining that with the, the sound aspect, the music aspect, allowed for uh, a kind of rich and variable and constantly evolving uh, work of art. Great. My name is Pablo. I'm from Switzerland and Spain. And this is my partner, uh, Josiah, from New York. Um, we, uh, our project is called Muscular Synergy. And that was uh, done in Barcelona as part of a uh, master studies. Uh, in the Institute for Advanced Architecture in Catalonia. And that was a six-week uh, project. And let's... <laughs> well... Okay, yeah, so uh, given the kind of time constraints that uh, we had used, um, we really tried to think about the, the process that we would take, how to move forward. So we always uh, started to work between uh, digital and physical realms, hoping that one could um, kind of inform the other. But the proposal itself um, is a hammam proposal in, for Tunisia. Um, the idea is that CNC sewn uh, laser cut sacks will be uh, manufactured basically anywhere in the world. Um, and we're interested in this idea of uh, the scarcity of um, kind of fabrication labs in areas such as Tunisia. Um, so these sacks can be uh, flat packed, sent to the site, and set up on site. And in this case, we were interested in using um, a natural material, so uh, the obvious answer was sand. Uh, so we, the idea is to fill these sacks with sand and then later introduce um, a bacteria uh, which acts as a hardening agent. So uh, once the sand is kind of soaked with this bacteria, um, a two to three day hardening process takes place and then you kind of have a permanent structure. So this allows for a lot of flexibility. But um, what's, uh, what it's more interesting, like uh, instead of... Uh, talking about the project is the, the whole process. And what we, we found out that we need actually these two sides uh, that you see the, the digital on one side and the physical on the other side. And through, uh, we will show you the whole process. Through so the process was always a back and forth and, and it's, it's this synergy of, of this both that, that uh, was very strong and we think it's, it's, not, uh, it's not possible to have one without the other. So one. Okay. Um, so uh, we chose to uh, concentrate on the arabesque uh, phyllotaxis pattern, um, and we were particularly interested in this pattern uh, for two main reasons. Uh, one is kind of this uh, idea of the scalar modularity. As the phyllotaxis expands, uh, you have a smaller component that's getting larger. Um, but also this idea that um, we, you're able to weave them together, uh, the intersecting spirals. So uh, structurally, uh, we were thinking, how can something that is fabric and then later hardened uh, be strong and stay structural? And uh, this idea of scale and weaving works together quite well. So we started with a geometry of this phyllotaxis. 
end up with a system uh, based on circles to to start a parametrical model that we uh, use to uh, have variations in heights and in in width. We used a grasshopper. Yeah, uh, the idea was to create a, these catalogs of variation um, so that we could uh, also introduce this shift factor. And up until this point, I mean, we were thinking about it as a hammam proposal, which is, uh, you know, the, a bathhouse. So we knew that uh, different areas um, would need kind of uh, different temperature zones in larger spaces or smaller spaces, but we were more uh, really kind of concentrating on this shift between digital and physical. So we kind of created our own tools uh, using Grasshopper um, to solve a problem which we would encounter in the physical side. So um, this is just kind of the parametric model. We wanted to see how that would actually work um, in the physical realm. So we just created this um, telescopic joint structure model, which would work pretty much exactly as the Grasshopper model um, allowed us to work with it in the digital realm. But this allowed us to then see uh, a different aspect of it, which then we could translate again. This is a plan of the Hammam, where you see the different uh, uh, program, uh, different uh, uh, conditions, space conditions. So the, the Hammam is situated in uh, Tunisia. It's, this is uh, the lake, uh, uh, North Lake. And uh, that was an analysis of the ground where we, we placed the Hammam uh, on the border. And uh, like in the beginning, we, we did, uh, that's quite, we translated from the digital uh, model. We made a, a rapid prototyping uh, to to uh, to an analyze, analyze the, the structure first and also the, the condition of light, the openings. That was not able. That we're not able to to do in uh, on digital, on the screen. All right. And again, this was kind of the first time that we were able to see uh, how thickness uh, of material would play a part in the way that these uh, fabric sacks could weave together. And again, again this is just uh, a digital prototype. But it was the first time that we were really able to see that physically. Um, but still, it wasn't enough. So we um, took to sewing and. Basically, we had to see how these uh, sacks would actually fit together uh, because it wasn't really imaginable just through the digital. Um, so <coughs> we began uh, kind of a process of um, making mock-up models. And this is our first kind of filled model, I would call it, uh, where we laser cut uh, fabric. We sewed together the pieces to create um, closed uh, sacks. And then we wove them together and filled them up. And this was uh, kind of a tell-all for us because we encountered uh, many good things, but we also saw that there were many issues. And the main issue that we encountered was um, kind of this bulging. And since they were just uh, sacks that were only, um, they are kind of uniformly uh, distributed, so you always got the same bulge. And you would kind of have these gigantic uh, bottom areas, and the top of the structure would just be empty. Um, so. So we started to to do tests and try to learn how is the material uh, uh, like uh, acting uh, with uh, with the terms of gravity and unpredictability. How much can we control? How much do we leave the unpredictability? And uh, so we uh, the way to control the thickness was to make a parametric model where we have this point uh, distribution where you see it's a, it's a gradient where on the bottom of the of the structure is a, you need a thicker uh, structure let's say uh, and and on the top it, it gets lighter and this is kind of our uh, response to the issues that we saw while doing our physical prototyping um, to create this tool which uh, in our specific specific case allowed us to fix the problem, but uh, we consider this uh, an open source tool in that uh, it could be adapted by other designers and other architects uh, to solve a similar problem, but to get a different result. So uh, in this case, 
not just laying out these dots and kind of controlling the thickness uh, wasn't really our response, but it was rather to create a parametric tool which could be then adapted to other projects as well. And here you can see, I mean, it's pretty simple, but basically the farther the points are, uh, the more expansion which is allowed in the uh, fabric sex. This is a section through uh, two spaces of the hammam. And the, the material, the fill-in material, the sand that we, uh, we introduced this uh, bacteria that would, uh, if you add urea, then the, the bacteria uh, solidifies, makes a sort of cement and uh, solidifies the, the sand, makes it as a limestone. And this is a process of a couple of days and then the bacteria dies. So we, uh, we could not afford this bacteria, so we had to simulate that. We used a plaster, a dry plaster and sand, we mixed it and uh, we filled the sacks and then we added the water to, to get the, the, the final uh, solidification. So uh, kind of a second larger scale, one to 10 model um, that we set up is, uh, we've implemented the point distribution model on the sacks um, after we had gone through initial testing, like b bacteria simulations. And um, let me just go back. You can see that we used kind of a temporary uh, frame to hold the structure up uh, before it was filled. These are just empty sacks that you're seeing. Um, and then we went through the process of uh, injecting them with sand, uh, once again uh, simulating kind of the introduction of bacteria by soaking the model and then allowing uh, several days to pass uh, so that um, the model could properly be hardened, uh, at which case we were able to um, take away the temporary structure and it was it stood by itself. These are just kind of before and after uh, bef dry sand with the temporary support still in it and then the after hardened model. So maybe this is uh, this is the end and to say again like a uh, this project was uh, was not uh, done digitally and then uh, trying to, to get it physically, but it was a, a back and forth and one information feeds the other. And this is uh, where actually where we think it's, uh, it's uh, the potential it has about digital fabrication, where, where it, uh, it, it's not only the clean uh, digital world, but you, you, need to, you need to use your hand, you need to make mistakes and to use, uh, to, to produce prototypes and feeds back uh, the digital model, so. And I think uh, that point which Pablo made, as well as this idea of um, how fabrication processes are working, um, the way that this can be fabricated in uh, one kind of developed country and sent to a less developed country, uh, and kind of the whole process is thought about in that way, uh, I'd say, that as well as this uh, working between physical and uh, digital realms is uh, the way that we would continue from here um, in future projects and implementing those ideas. Okay, I think that's I it. Think that's it. <laughs> Hi, as you know, we are part of a fab research cluster. So before starting our presentation, we would like to take the opportunity to thank all the people who helped us along the way. Alan, who helped us with any sort of possible means to further our research, Chris, mom, Brett Steele, and also the directors of MTech program who n nourished the idea of thinking differently. Um, Mike Weinstock, um, Michael Hansen, and Achim Menges, and also all of our sponsors um, I mean, if it wasn't for them, um, they wouldn't be able to reach to this stage. So our research basically starts um, by questioning traditional and <coughs> inanimate objects. Since traditional buildings are incapable of reacting to their immediate environment, they are not capable, uh, capable of um, creating suitable environmental situation for the residents. So they have to use extensive amounts of electromechanical devices to um, produce suitable environments. So here, 
We plan to create a system that is capable of reacting to the immediate surrounding environment. We started our research by studying nature as they are <coughs> natural system, systems are capable of reacting to the environment and also still they are structurally viable. We chose pneumatic material system because they are one of the lightest spatial means, uh, um, <coughs> lightest means uh, of spatial organization, but also they share a lot of similarities with natural systems. What we plan to do on it, uh, we plan to introduce these adaptable openings in order to potentially increase this um, quality of spaces created by this material system. So here in our system, all, all the sensing and decision making happens locally and from interaction of these local responses, co collective and distributed, and distributed intelligence takes place. Uh, in this presentation, we are going to take you through through designing and fabrication uh, process that we did in uh, two stages of AFAP competition. The first stage was our initial prototype made, and uh, in the second one, we made the final prototype, which you could see in the exhibition. Our initial experiment started with element study. Uh, which we carefully measured the deformation of the element in uh, inflate and deflate stage, and uh, we also tested the capacity of uh, structural capacity of the element. We also um, uh, Tristan Simon from ROP AGU helped us uh, to understand more better of the uh, structural capacity and run this analysis. After that, we arrange uh, uh, the element in a couple of ways and we um, get two uh, types of prototypes, porous structural component and opening uh, component. By composing these two, we reached our initial prototype or component, uh, which uh, capable of bearing load and uh, uh, while it is porous. Uh, opening mechanism, so how it is work is when the surface of the pneumatic structure uh, hit by direct sunlight, the trigger pressure inside the pneumatic increases and uh, the pressure sensitive valve, which is between pneumatic and the opening, opens up and it lets the air go through uh, the pneumatic muscle and it opens the component. After finding our initial component, we start to test how it performs in the environment and we set up two types of experiments, shadow casting and natural cross ventilation. Uh, the experiment started with active light penetration control which we injected smoke into to the new and by that we can control the transparency of the new from fully transparent to uh, like 90% translucent. Sorry. <laughs> then uh, we started to test the direct sunlight uh, analysis and the first uh, analysis showed us that uh, the percentage of shadow casting of the component is not so desirable so we start to change the uh, manipulate the geometry in two different ways, in height manipulation and lower radial manipulation. And uh, with, uh, in that process, we understand that higher components work b better around noon and uh, wider lower radial components works better around evening and morning. Uh, with this information, now we know where to put the components in the global geometry. Uh, lower radial components can be on east and west side and while we are going to center and up can put higher, it can change to higher types of component and the result uh, showed that we have 80 percent, more than 80 percent shadow casting through uh, the hottest days of summer. Then uh, we did the same with the CFT analysis. We uh, tested the component in uh, different uh, geometrical manipulation, in different heights, in different angles of openings. And uh, again, we understand how, where we should put different types of component in the global geometry. And that's how the complexity of the 
uh, global geometry arise from the simplicity of the uh, local components? So, for the, I mean, for starting the fabrication process, we made a test model, I mean, in studio by hand sealers, but we carried on, and we ended up with a fabricated component manufactured by uh, Inflate Company. And in that one, we started to test high-frequency sealing um, um, to uh, basically seal the PVC. And also, we tested point connection and also uh, different sorts of connections such as poppers and valves into the component, which we used a lot in the second uh, phase, too. We, but we also t faced loads of difficulties. As majority of the process included non-planar welding process, and also we found that it's impossible to weld elastic muscle to non-elastic PVC, we had to radically revise the design process of the project in the second phase. Therefore, we went back to the element study which we carried out in the beginning of the process, and we, we went again back to the inherited characteristic of pneumatics, which are larger uh, when they are deflated and slightly smaller when they are inflated. With that, we created a component comprised of two layers. Well, the first layer is always inflated and the second layer is um, deflated when the component is closed and inflated when the component wants to grow open. And once the, um, I mean the top layer starts to inflate, it contracts and pulls the lower layer and rolls it up. But as you saw, the component in this stage was planar. So we started to um, study planar quad surfaces to, in order to achieve complex duplicate surfaces for environmental modulation purposes, to uh, change the oyster curve of surfaces and achieve flat panels for duplicate surfaces. So this surface that you can see here, the duplicate surface that you can see here, is made out of complete flat panels that you can see here. And it allows us to proliferate the components on it, as you can see now. And once we have all the components on the surface, we can go further and control the uh, angle of the opening and also the, the density of uh, the cylinders along, uh, let's say, one module. So once we had that, we connected the model, the geometry, into the solar analysis data. And as you can see on the right-hand side of the image, uh, the model represents um, the um, reaction of the surface to the location of the sun around 10 in the morning. You can see a close-up image. Having global, complex, and duplicate surfaces not only allow us to achieve formal attraction, but also, in our specific purpose, allows us to control the global behavior of uh, the geometry to achieve natural ventilation and shadow casting. So here, within a short case study, I will explain how we can anticipate and control the global behavior of the geometry, which we did earlier on in the stage one. So once, in this specific case, we chose a couple of buildings to, to be covered up by a surface to create an intermediary, an intermediary space which is naturally ventilated. So once the, uh, once the initial uh, surface is set, we could calculate the exact locations of opening by a solar access analysis and direct sunlight, and then extract the data and connect it to Rhino scripting to uh, predict the exact location of the opening throughout the day, as you can see here, three examples, and then by applying the surface roughness factor into the, surf, uh, into the geometry to get it closer to the reality and creating a microenvironment and applying the average local wind into uh, the setup, we managed to establish this first set of experiments. In this uh, particular experiment, you can see around 
morning, there is no uh, cross ventilation activated within the building, and around afternoon, there is no well distribution of fresh air within the building. So, via some geometrical manipulation, we managed to achieve the achieve a geometry which activates active cross. Uh, cross ventilation within the envelope and also well distribution of fresh air to the building. So now that we know how the system basically works, it's, we want to explain how we fabricated the whole thing. We decided to um, combine and integrate the opening component with high pressure um, cylinders. The reason that we chose high pressure uh, cylinders is because they are capable of bearing structural loads wind loads and snow loads to some certain extent. So then we integrated the opening to the structure and uh, so, so that always the first element of the opening contributes within the structural forces of uh, the whole system. So here briefly you can see how we installed the whole thing. As you saw, the structure is so light that can be carried by just one person to the site. And once we inflate the high pressure tubes, they are independent, in, at least in this stage, independent to the air supply and stayed, uh, stayed totally inflated at least so far. So then we uh, inflated the whole system up and you can see that gradually it started to work. This is the whole system installed in this um, exhibition space. And here you see how it works. <coughs> so in the end, we would like to say, as much as we are happy about our achievement in this stage, which was introducing those adaptable openings through this material system and also having those high pressure uh, tubes and self achieving self-supportive structure, which is adaptable, we still want to further our research and we'll still see loads of points that should be developed in the next stage. And they include developing more like the openings in order to achieve more freedom in terms of formal geometry, uh, form of the global geometry, and also testing different uh, configuration of the structure to achieve stru more structural rigidity in larger forms. And in the end, hopefully, we're looking forward to have a larger, more sophisticated, and functioning global geometry. Thank you.